Hey, hey, Jessica. <laughs> Ma, Steve, can I introduce you to my mom? My Hello, look. Yeah, yeah, I have it. <laughs> so, Kiki is not coming. Is Kiki not coming? No. Probably she went to the wrong place or something. Oh. I don't know. She could. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yes, okay. <coughs> Do I need to, to press a button or something? Do I need to press a button or do, no. it would just, uh, yeah, I would start. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> so good morning everyone. Can you hear me? Up there? Can we laugh? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Welcome uh, to this uh, ceremony. Uh, today we are um, having one of the most important events in the academic year because we are the, the highest grade that you can get out of the university is actually the PhD, the stuff of the doctor. And today we have the, the pleasure uh, of having Elaria Valletta here to um, defend her uh, assessment framework for managing corporate sustainable manufacturing. And uh, of course, you are a very important person. There are some other important person here too. We have the grading, grading committee who will eventually decide and be the representative of the, of the public 
the society. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Elina Gutten and Sarit. Sarivirta. I should have practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did. But I <laughs> and she is the principal scientist at VTT for circular economy, heavy industry, and raw materials. And uh, she's focusing on material modeling and eco this eco design. We have also from uh, Sweden, uh, Professor Christina Clausen Jonsson. She is the head of R&D at NCC Group. And we have uh, Professor um, Dr. Sebastian Tide from the University of Braunschweig. He is the uh, vice head of the department for the Institute of Machine Tools and Production Technology, focusing on, on manufacturing, sustainable manufacturing, and life cycle engineering. So we are in, in the academic world. We also use it around there. We really love long titles. <laughs> it's the best thing we can really have. We have another very important person here also, which is the opponent who is going to scrutinize Ilaria's um, <laughs> thing. For, and I know that I told Ilaria that the more you write, the more you have to defend. <laughs> so this would be a very interesting uh, session. Professor Steve Evans, uh, Director of Research, Industrial Sustainability at the University of Cambridge. We also have uh, a person who is not yet here, uh, uh, Professor Henrike Baumann from Technology Management and Economics. Uh, she, she is the adjunct part of the Green uh, Committee. We have another important person, which is Bjorn uh, Johansson, um, which is the, the main supervisor of Ilaria for, for these years. And then there's me. I am the chairman of this session. I am professor of production systems and head of, of the division of production systems here at Chalmers. And I am the examiner of uh, uh, the uh, Kelvin. So this, and then you're all here. We you know yourself. <laughs> and uh, you are actually have a, you are a very important person too, because you are representing the society here today. And this is a, a presentation of something that has been some research that has been uh, done for several years. And uh, now it's up to the candidate to present this to the society and so for the society to say, well, this was very good research. Thank you very much. This was something that brought the society forward. But I think that it, it's very important that you during this process uh, try to think of some questions that you as a representative society could ask the, the, the candidate here before you let her go into our next phase of, of academic or, or other kind of life. So the process here today uh, is as such. First, the candidate will present her thesis in about half an hour. About. And then after that, we hand over the word to the opponent. And the opponent can, uh, since your work is extremely important here, you can go on as long as you like, actually. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> Maybe I should you say you that. Say that. Academics like long titles. Yes. yes. So like long talks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, so I, I knew it was dangerous to say that to <laughs> <laughs> professor from <laughs> Cambridge. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, but that is actually uh, a session I know, but uh, the, the presentation that kept on for three hours, I think, in Finland, actually. And uh, but we, we will see. And uh, when you you think that you have uh, exhausted the possibilities to find something in her thesis, good or bad, we will hand over the the work to the grading committee, and you will have uh, also as much time as you like because you are the ones deciding. So it's very important that you get the time that you need. And after that, we have the, the, the word to you, because then you have severed a lot of uh, the questions to Laria. And after that is finished, uh, we will go back to the department and the grading committee, and together with me and the the uh, supervisor and the opponent will have a, a session a meeting uh, chaired by one of the grading uh, committee persons 
where the decision will be made. If this is uh, passed, we will uh, have something to eat up at the department at the fifth floor in the, the next building. So, that was uh, seven minutes of, of explanations <laughs> to start with. So now mm -hmm. I will actually give the word to you, Elaria, and I wish you good luck with your presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> Welcome everyone, my name is Ilaria Barletta and today I'm going to explain how we can achieve a more sustainable manufacturing if we start looking at production systems more intelligently and if management is put in a key position to make key decisions about sustainable manufacturing. For this to happen, they might need some sort of cognitive tools to illustrate the opportunities and the possibility to make different decisions. In my research, I develop new tools, but also improved existing ones that can process rich and complex information related to production systems performance and related impact, in particular, economic and environmental performance. Let me give you a simple example from the automotive sector, for instance. You have a shop floor where there are CNC, computer numerical control machine tools. And they, of course, in order to cut the parts and do the get, um, cutting operations, they need some energy. So it's a key performance here is to analyze energy efficiency performance in order for the energy manager to know what, how the plant is performing. And of course, it is possible to calculate CO2 emissions and climate impacts. But also think of how interesting it is when you have a increased burden in the production system, a new technology, a new machine, for instance, that will consume more, but it will also allow to have greater environmental gains throughout the life cycle. So it's not all about factories here. The point that I want to make is that I believe that if management had timely access to this information and also understood the value of it, then we can achieve a more sustainable manufacturing. The assessment framework, which you can read in the title of my thesis, is a structure which contains such tools and allows management to, uh, allows this tool to be more accessible to the decision makers that matter. I always found manufacturing as the most beautiful expression of human intellect in all its forms. But we can no longer ignore that the modus operandi, the <coughs> model that we adopted so far is not viable anymore and has surpassed the planetary boundaries, our safe operating space. The problem with this current reality seems that for some, it's far too complicated to even begin to tackle. But is it really? In 2015, the United Nations issued the 17 Sustainable Development Goals to drive the 2030 agenda of a more sustainable future. The 12th goal is responsible consumption and production. And I'm focusing on the production part of it, which basically tells to do more with less. Less pollution, less degradations, less uh, consumption of natural resources. It is fairly obvious that the manufacturing industry will play a big role in the extent to which this goal can be achieved. There are two key terms here in my research, production and manufacturing. I will be using production every time I'm talking about the systems which realize components and products and manufacturing every time I talk about the industry and the companies. When I started industrial and man management engineering for my master program, I learned to look at production system 
thanks to a model, a simplified version of reality. And the model looked like this. Now, there are a lot of elements to discuss here, but the key message is that a production system is a transformation process that transforms into in input into output as much valuable as possible. And of course, in a production system, you might have one or more boxes like this. But the key part that I'm focusing here is the active environment. So management and goal system and information system. Now, management, and I'm talking about the activity, I'm not talking about the people, is the act of allocating resources to a system so that it performs efficiently and effectively towards the achievement of a desired goal or target. And also, it follows that management is concerned about performance. It goes without saying that if this is the goal to be achieved, then sustainability should be integrated in the decision-making criteria of these people in the same way time, cost, and quality is normally integrated. Also, since the problem is so severe and so urgent, we need to have this integration not as a kind of feel-good activity in production. It should actually tackle the material issue of the company. And it should be on an ongoing stage, an ongoing basis. And also, we don't need a few virtuous companies doing that very well. This approach should be scalable throughout the industry. So now you know what led to research question one. How can manufacturing companies integrate economic and environmental sustainability factors into their production systems, both in the development phase and the operations phase? Research question one kept me, kept me busy for most of my time as a PhD student. But then something happened. I adjusted the route and I started to think differently about the problem. And two key realizations marked this paradigm shift in thinking. I realized at some point that I was treating management as a kind of passive recipient of these tools, but actually it should be seen as users and possibly even participants of what we as academics develop. And the second realization is that production systems are part of the system, they are not insular. So what could be the way for me to see management from this perspective? is actually to start with fundamental, simple yet fundamental questions. What is sustainable manufacturing to you? And as I collected their answers, the topics of the conversation moved from quantitative KPIs, K performance indicators, the holy grail of management, to organizational capabilities and sustainability strategies. <clears throat> and this is a shift that makes sense because the sustainability, sustainability is a long-term direction of a system. And organizational capability is a concept that comes from management research. And it is an activity that is critical for the competitiveness of the firm. And not surprisingly, some scholars define sustainability as a dynamic capability of the firm. And when I delved into this kind of literature, I found that seminal scholars in manufacturing uh, studied the missing link between strategy and operation. So in order to achieve performance excellence, if we really want to improve performance, instead of jumping to different programs and kind of improvement initiative, maybe we should start looking at this link between strategy and operation. I can give you an example of what it means because I understand there could be an abstract concept a shipbuilding company that I interviewed, the PLM lead said that, uh, and also the UX uh, sustainability designer said that our company, we declared we, that our company will be the most sustainable shipbuilding company. And they are working hard for making it happen. Modernization of the old crane, for instance. But sometimes we have, the shipyard is so huge and there are so many subcontractors 
that sometimes you just don't know where the pipes are. Just components are scattered everywhere. Sometimes they need to duplicate the production. So clearly, something that they need to address rather than a performance as such is actually increasing the situational awareness, increasing the awareness of who is doing what, what has been produced. And it is very clear that if I wanted to analyze these concepts, I couldn't be using a positive or post-positive approach. These are constructs that need to be modeled. And, but at the same time, again, I want management to have something that allowed them to see the problem and solve it. So I needed to be pragmatic. And this was a difficult, uh, difficult uh, uh, way to navigate the, the field. But I tried to solve it in a certain way. I said, OK, so we talked about misalignment, missing link, mismatch. Is there any way for me to quantify this with match? It's not going to be perfect, but it's still a tangible measurement to take actions upon. So now you know what led to research question two. How can manufacturing companies align their operations with their corporate sustainability strategy? And again, since I'm looking at the production system, operations are in production systems. The activities that I carried out are, um, for research question two, are placed in the second half of my research. But I talked about <coughs> management before, so I know many of you are asking who are these people. First of all, in my research, I interviewed a couple of dozen uh, professionals in middle management position and top management positions. Uh, at the middle management, in our case in manufacturing, we might have energy managers, operations managers, factory managers. And at the strategic level, of course, we have CEO, CFOs, and now we have chief sustainability officers too. Why do we need these people on board? First of all, middle management has invaluable knowledge on process performance and behavior. And the top has the power to lead change across the organization and beyond. And several researchers in applied, uh, applied type of research have developed several support tools to help solve specific problems that especially middle management has. For instance, optimizing the energy consumption in the shop floor. And there is a huge literature actually on uh, support tools, especially for the product design part, but also for production systems. But the problem is that other scholars also noted that there is a gap of applicability between the offer from academia and what is actually being used in practice. This gap is disappointing. This is a waste of knowledge. So what, what did I want to do? By combining the knowledge that I gained from exploring research question one to research question two, I tried to put them together in an assessment framework for managing corporate sustainable manufacturing with the hope to connect assessment and management. And this is to ultimately to help them influence economic and environmental performance of production system positively. Where is the territory where I moved? So my research is at the intersection of sustainable manufacturing and corporate sustainability. The methodological approach that I used to explore sustainable manufacturing, energy efficiency, energy management, technology assessment of technologies for production systems is taken, comes from the life cycle engineering methodological approach. I'm sure many of you have heard of life cycle thinking. And for corporate sustainability, actually, I don't mean uh, topics such as business ethics or philanthropies. Actually, if you look at corporate sustainability, from a management, uh, a management research and management sciences, it actually aims to ask fundamental question of how companies meet the need of direct and indirect stakeholders in the long run. 
Again, you can see the possible answers to these questions according to different theories of the firm, which basically ask what is the purpose of company and how they stay competitive and relevant. And in my case, I chose the resource-based theory of the firm. Resource means that basically, this theory means that companies gain competitiveness and have their purpose of being there because they provide a unique set of resources, not just because they have the right technology or the right material and so forth, but also when we talk about resources and capabilities, we talk about cognitive capabilities, the abilities to be flexible, production flexibility, or, or other qualities that are particularly unique and comes with a lot of knowledge embedded in it. Some feature of the research design. So it's mixed method overall, as you can see. And also there are four main studies that uh, of course, came from the case study research methodologies. And in each study, as you can see, could be either a single case study or a multiple case study. The way to read this illustration is that, for instance, for paper six, uh, you might, it's quantitative study addressing research question one, and for paper four, is a mixed method study addressing research question one. Uh, seven individual contributions are published or submitted to uh, in um, encapsulated in uh, seven papers and 14 were the company cases overall here you can see 13 cases numbered from a to m uh, that uh, contributed to the papers to the knowledge that i put in the papers and these companies range across different sectors in manufacturing the size is variable, could be from five employees to 400,000 employees, and is always discrete manufacturing. I didn't address the process industry. How did I collect the data? Of course, it's extremely important that I understand how production operations work. And what for me was incredibly interesting is that I get to visit not only a traditional mainstream car manufacturing plant, but also shipyards and also uh, what's happening in the circular economy paradigm. I visited the facility where electronic waste are sorted because the whole point of this resource uh, responsible consumption and production is to bring as much value, uh, material components capabilities back into the product life cycle. Uh, in this seven papers there are there is knowledge from 17 semi-structured interview but i carried out personally 10 of them i led three focus groups and also i launched three surveys for tool validation purposes how did i come up with a framework given what you see here it was an iterative process and it was an act of interpretation and reflexivity so it's, of course, inductive reasoning, trying to find common pattern if there is a message between what these tools tell us of how management can actually understand and lead sustainable manufacturing. And so there was a work of synthesis and I uh, drew different uh, list of six criteria by which a certain tool or contribution could uh, be included in the framework or not. Now, this is, you can have a glimpse of the silhouette of the assessment framework. There are three main layers. And I call these layer functions because their purpose is to support management in a certain way. And the first one is uh, addresses research question one, uh, sorry, two. And the second and the third research question one. Also, the way whereby they are located represents the organization's decision-making level. So here it will it's going to support the operational level, here the tactical level, and here the strategic level. Let's go through one by one. Function one supports management in aligning sustainability strategies with operations, understanding where the hotspots are, Research, sorry, a function two uh, supports the assessment of sustainability impact of R&D technologies. 
And what I mean by that is that R&D technologies are emerging technologies for which there is a lot of uncertainty within them. So it's a complex problem. And third function, it might look mainstream, but it's still relevant and needs to be addressed, improves sustainability performance of operations. So pure efficiency here. Now, how did I populate this framework? What is inside? Is a, a four method and two tools for sustainability assessment of production systems. What is the difference between method and tool? Sometimes there is a little bit of confusion and I adopted a language that would clarify this for my research. A method of the assessment is a procedure, a recipe with which you do something. For life cycle assessment, we have a nice standard for that. And the tool is actually an infrastructure, a technological infrastructure, like a computer program, for instance, that wraps this method and make the method usable for the intended users in a way that management, in this case, won't need any intermediary figure in the, in the middle, could be a researcher or an analyst. So let's see how this framework works. Let's assume that top management is convinced, is on board. We need to do something about this goal. What can we do? First of all, we might want to start with a strategy that should be embedded in the business strategy, as several scholars pointed out and consultants pointed out, this is key. And not necessarily the companies that I interviewed had a sustainability strategy, but still I invited them to explain what would that be. And as I collected and summarized the data, I found that they were describing the strategy according to two dimensions a complexity and scope of sustainability. So I talked about life cycle thinking before. Some people were extremely aware that the product life cycle is what needs to be seen and uh, lifted up, but some were only concerned about what, happen in, what happens in the companies and in, fact, in their factories. So factory scope, product life cycle thinking scope. The complexity of sustainability is a concept that exists in uh, sustainability uh, engineering education for sustainability and it basically explain how people see the interconnectedness the how the different buckets of the bottom line are intertwined or not so if management see connection between economic and environmental performance economic and social performance of the if they or alternatively if they treat it as a different buckets now that there is an understanding of, of where they can stand here, old school or systemic, then is the time to see how we can apply to operation. And here I invited management to be focused, to start with the most important issue. That's why I use the concept of organizational capability and in this case, manufacturing capability. In the literature, you might find examples like pollution prevention, product stewardship, by inviting them to tell what they are, what it is in their case. And it could be something like also improving the product quality. Again, in the shipbuilding industry, in the case that I explained you before, if you don't have the components that will be put and connected for forming the hull, then you might have, and if it doesn't uh, fulfill the specification, then you might have huge waste. You might need to, for instance, uh, lose, it, it could be that you can lose a lot of painting that you used before. It could be that you need to weld pieces together with dangerous welding operation. So simple things sometimes that are kind of hardcore manufacturing matters for sustainability a lot. And by focusing on this capability that needs to be mature, and this is again a, a, an important concept in management research, I come up with them with a tool to measure the readiness of production systems to build this capability. Most of the time you might find in the literature maturity model, I prefer to call readiness, and I will tell you why in the discussion. But the key point is that I started actually with a uh, already existing conceptual model that uh, explain, it basically 
lean basic lean production, how processes are known and can be repeatable. And then I enriched this model thanks to the input that I gained from six company cases, because we started exploring how can we make these processes repeatable. So it turns out that we need a huge infrastructure to make it happen. We need organizational competences. We need to have the right data. We need to have information systems that store this data. We talked a lot about single source of truth. So we have created a model according to what the needs were. Now that we understood where the OSPOR are, let's move to the second part. Sustainability impacts of R&D technologies. As I said before, I had the opportunity to see what's happening in the uh, product uh, end of life. There could be several strategies to handle it better than we do right now. And the case that we analyzed was a optical sorter of electronic waste. So when you get the electronic waste from the collection scheme, they could be sorted according to different criteria. We have different categories under the directive, but why do we give them to, to recycle? There could be a lot of value in that. So in this project, we understood, we try to understand the implication of a optical sorter that is powered by AI. So the algorithm know and learn how to sort them better. Could be, for instance, what we call waste that is actually valuable and can be candidate for reuse or repurposes, repurposing. Or actually, the reality should go to recycling. So the first way for me to understand the vaccine production was simply to come up with a multi-criteria analysis to understand what the operating cost of this machine will be in comparison to the manual sorting, what are the impacts in production, how much energy will consume, what will be the impacts on the inventory, and so forth. But then again, I said, hey, we shouldn't look at the factories only here. What's going to happen? To the product end of life and what is going to happen in terms of benefits across the product life cycle. So I started asking myself, we can calculate the environmental break-even point of this machine. And it's very clear what the cost line is because basically you calculate the environmental impact from the bill of materials of the machine and you know pretty much the operating uh, energy that it takes. But the green line is incredibly variable in slope because it depends on the sorting accuracy, it depends on how lucky you are when you get the, the quality of the material, the, the quality of the waste, again, uh, received. So this is something that uh, tells that actually this investment could pay off with the right conditions anytime soon or later in the future. Third point. KPIs, we know that they are king when it comes to improvement of sustainability performance of operations. And this is actually how I started my research. I started looking at energy management in production and how to support managers in their, um, in their understanding of how to improve the energy efficiency performance. Now, again, I'm talking about um, CNC machines. And, and I thought, I thought okay, 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 so, so well, normally we, 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 we consider, consider simple, simple uh, efficiency, efficiency measurement, measurement, which is energy, energy consumption part, part. But if but we, have, we have to have to have management, then, then, then maybe they might, they might need to break it break down, 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 down in this area of the part and make it more and more explainable. So, so one part, part is about, about what, what uh, the energy that is lost because of the quality issues. One, because of inefficiency in the production line, the line is not balanced correctly and the machines are waiting for nothing. And the other one is for maintenance issues, like down, for instance. This can give management indication of why we are not improving and what the priorities are. But as we know, I'm talking about the whole manufacturing industry, and for some industry, energy is, is still an issue, but they probably don't need this indicator as well as for the automotive side. And I said, okay, so for imp the improvement of sustainability performance of operations, maybe we might need, again, the underlying structure to support this improvement. 
And I contributed to test, back then was a draft of a standard, now this standard is approved, is the ASTM E301216. And this is a standard guide to, um, to model the environmental aspects of manufacturing processes. There is a big case to have a formalism to describe the, all the elements of a manufacturing pro system, resources, inputs, outputs, parameters for project trans process transformations and so forth. And the goal of this is to constitute a formalism so that benchmarking <coughs> is clear across plant and life cycle inventories match, they have the same name. So this is the whole package, but what is the flow? Is there any way that is more clever than pick and choose in which they could use this? I did not prescribe a specific flow, but if I had to give an example or a demonstration, I would go like this. I would start with the strategy. I would use the readiness tool. I will tackle the most important issue in the production system. It could be data and availability, it could be maintenance issue. And once we are in operations, I think probably some of you know the theory of constraints. You can say, okay, we address the most important issues. Maybe we can stay here at this level and harvest the other long hang low hanging fruits. Once we make sure that this is done, we could actually go a little bit bolder and look out, out, um, out of our factories and see what technologies can help us have more destructive impact across the life cycle. Contributions. What does this framework tell us? I will divide it in two contributions to knowledge and to practice. Contribution to knowledge. I would say that the strong point of this approach is that invites two words to talk to each other, sustainability assessment and sustainability management. Each tool contains implication for management that they could use and why this is important. And of course, there are specific areas of contribution, which is energy efficiency and uh, technology assessment and organizational maturity for sustainability. But the strong point is merging these two words together. Practice is pretty self-explanatory that these tools and methods are supposed to be used in practice, but maybe the more relevant question is to which extent they can actually contribute to merge the gap between research and uh, um, academia and, uh, and industry. And what I can tell about it is ascribable to what I got from the uh, validation test that I performed. And I can say that some tools are better than others to be implemented uh, straight after, and others need to wait a little bit of more technological upgrade. Conclusion, what can we conclude from this research? Let's recap the research questions. The first one, asks how we integrate economic environmental sustainability factors into their production systems. And I analyze both the operations and the development phase of a production system when we have a new machine, for instance, that will change the structure of it. And research question two is about the alignment of sustainability strategy and the operations. The fact that I could put the knowledge that I gained from two, these two research questions in an assessment framework allowed me to gain some um, uh, overall maximum common denominator that could answer both research questions. It is true that KPIs are a great tool for management to make decisions, and most of the, the outcome of most of my tool is concretized in a K-performance indicator or a measurement. However, there is a step between having the information and do something about. And it's extremely critical that for this second step to happen, management should be involved and willing to start the sustainability transition. There should be something for them that tell, okay, now I am, it's the legitimate case for me to do something about it. Also, what, I, what we can learn from it is that sustainability should be a strategy 
And we can actually connect it to operation if we look, if we use the concept of organizational capability to address the most important issue and do a step-by-step -step approach as opposed to be overwhelmed by project program and initiatives. To conclude, what this assessment framework tells us and especially companies is that manufacturing companies are accountable agents for a sustainable future, also because now they have the tools to make the change happen. Thank you very much. private conversation in public. <laughs> right, so right, right. It's yes. very challenging. So <laughs> we'll work out the social dynamics of mm -hmm. how to do that properly and politely. Um, examining a PhD is normally done in my system in private because the examiners are terrible people, right? You know what's about to happen. I am not going to ask you any nice questions. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the strengths of your work. I'm going to look for every poor sentence, every weakness, and try to kill you. Right? And if I do my job well, nobody wants to talk to me. And your committee feels so sorry for you that they make you pass. <laughs> okay. That's the system. So please don't expect me to be very nice, okay. right? <laughs> and for those people who have read this document, there will be entire sections I'm not going to talk about because those are the good ones. And you will go, what? why isn't the, that's, that's where I'm going to look good? No, I'm not that nice, right? Only the tough questions. So let me start. That's the warning for everyone. I'm really sorry about this. It's, it's the truth of the examination process. And on the very beginning, you've got an abstract on page I, right? Very Latin. Uh, and you talk about uh, the overall nature of the framework as a conveyor of a mindset. Mm -hmm. which then leverages management's capacity. And I thought that sentence was really interesting in the abstract. It, it's not in the rest of the thesis, um, but you've expressed very similar ideas here. So I just wanted you to expand. What do you mean by the framework is a conveyor of a mindset? Yeah. So what if you look at support of management that is achieved via a specific method or a specific tool, then, as I said, you can get a certain measurements and you act upon that, and that's it. The, what happens when you put things together, in this case, methods and tool, and you see a pattern or a logic, is that actually, the, the mindset that emerge is that, first of all, is not only our problem. We have to look at our factories and product life cycle, which I wanted to express here. So this is the first element that can hopefully shake the mindset a little bit. And the other core element is that maybe locally, management could do a good job if we look at specific indicators. <coughs> Um, but are we actually going in the right direction or vice versa? Maybe our top has ambitious goal to, to be more sustainable, but then 
there are a lot of things get, that gets lost, even with the best intention. So the idea behind this framework is, hey, there is a product life cycle that everyone is accountable for. And we have to look at this and start talking a little bit more with our supplier and understand how our customers are also thinking about the product. Maybe we can change it in another way. And also to have more communications and more awareness of what happens in factories. So connecting the top to the bottom. So these two are the main axes of the mindset that I try to convey. So it, seem, it seems to me that you have an idea that there's a wrong mindset. I know why you are asked that question right. is because yeah, yeah, the new mindset, what is the old mindset? And, uh, yeah. and you do refer to old thinking sometimes. Yeah, old school. And, uh, so is, yeah. is there a, is, is your main worry that there is a way of thinking amongst manufacturing management mm -hmm. which understands sustainability maybe in a narrow way or in a wrong way? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to use right or wrong, but uh, I think if the goal, in respect to the goal, I can say that if we really want to achieve the cell goal or responsible consumption and production for sure. And it's also like in the, actually in the logo of the, of the, the goal, then for sure, the old school that I described before, just thinking about sustainability in buckets and thinking about what happens in the factory. Yeah, that will achieve some improvement, of course. And this is especially, I would say, huge in the process industry. If we get a 3% of improvement, then it's, then it's a big achievement, I would say, in our performance that is really critical. But that is not the end of the story. So this is what I want to say with, with the framework. You talked about, and I thought it was a really interesting story. And by the way, you, I'm, I am going to say something positive. Your graphic about the time journey and how the different ideas fitted together and how your research methods fitted together was really clear. It, it was very helpful, but that just allows me to ask nastier questions. So it's it's not that positive, right? And you talked about this moment. Yeah. You put this sort of big yellow stars yeah. like, wow. And you started off mainly in a quantitative world thinking mm -hmm. my tool will solve a problem. And then you started, it seems to me, to understand my tool isn't gonna change a mindset. Right? Yeah. And that's the moment yeah, that's when cool. you realize, I, if I want this thing to work, I have to be bolder and bigger. And I have to deal with the human condition. I have to deal with the fact that most people are stupid. Most of the time. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what it felt like? <laughs> uh I mean, okay, I will explain what I, my answer, and then I will explain why my answer is not always the case. So the idea behind producing tools and methods that give you a key information is that there is the assumption that the, peop the, the person has such lack of awareness of understanding because lacks of information. So you bring the information to this person and say, and you might expect that he or she sees the light. Oh, now, now finally I change my mindset or do something about it. Uh, there is such a thing called, and this is actually what the information deficit model says in, in psychology. But, and this was actually used to, uh, to explain, actually some uh, psychologists said, well, if we look at how science is being communicated, especially for topics like climate change, that are highly polarized and still there is a lot of skepticism besides scientific evidence and consensus, 97% or something like that. Clearly this model doesn't work <laughs> because you present the information that is fact-checked, scientific and so forth, and still nothing happens later. So <laughs> yeah, I, I could say I could actually bring the information and assume these people will understand. But, and I still believe that there is a lot of value in that, but something else needs to happen. So it could be public engagement, could be other, other areas that I'm not competent in, but other people and other researchers are. So I'll, I'll agree with you. The information deficit model, uh, the one that says, if you give people the right information, they will make better decisions hey, we've got Brexit, okay? <laughs> right? 
clearly that does not explain the human condition. Um, and that insight, without the information, you can't make good decisions either. So it's yeah, still exactly, exactly, absolutely exactly. necessary. Yeah. So I think it's a good moment of insight. How did you feel at that moment? You went, wow, my, my research has just exploded. Yeah. Now I have to read about psychology and all of these other things. <laughs> Uh, it was both exciting and overwhelming. Uh, in what way? It was exciting because I felt connected with other people who were trying to address my same goals in other direction. So I felt people are really trying to address the problems in different ways. And if we do it all together, for sure we will lead somewhere. But at the same time, I think the, the problem lies where is so interconnected, it's not like independent. Like I fix this variable and it's a little bit a good step and then I fix this other variable. They are interconnected. So at some point the complexity became, became huge and I had to make a decision of what kind of researcher I want to be and what is the message that I want to give and what I can tell according to my own research also. What, what is your first degree? Industrial and management engineering. <laughs> so uh, that's my degree. <laughs> we teach people about rational thinking. Yeah. You know, that if you give people the right information, they'll make the right decision and hopefully with the right tools. And then you go and work in real factories and you yeah. go, wow. And that moment, that star happens. Yeah if you go to work yeah right and it happens for you in yeah. in your research so in your aim mm? can i remind you what yes, you wrote yes, in your aim yes. your aim is to develop an assessment framework for sustainable manufacturing to make corporate management understand how to positively influence blah 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 make management understand mm. you see where my emphasis yeah. is coming yeah. do you think you can achieve that aim of making management understand you sound like you're doing yeah, this yeah, when yeah, you're writing I that am. sentence do you think you can make them understand what i learned from the the conversation that i had and also the results from the surveys when i tested the tools sometimes the reaction was extremely polarized so some people get really excited that finally they have an information that a new way of thinking. I said, oh, okay, I never thought about the environmental break even or something. But I would say there are a lot of naysayers. For instance, oh, it's too, it's going to be, it's going to consume a lot of time, research. We don't have the competences. So my hope, what the hope that I had is I understand that some issues are easier to solve. Like, for instance, if we do a value stream mapping, sometimes we can find that there is a hotspot and, and uh, we address it. Other issues, especially when it comes to eco-effectiveness and life cycle thinking, require some sort of specific competence from life cycle prediction, life cycle assessment prediction. It's gonna take time, but the point that I was aiming at, how can I make you understand that it's worth spending the time You're and still getting doing. the code? <laughs> You're still doing this, right? Yeah. Can I suggest that, and I really like your answer, by the way, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's interesting to think about why sometimes it does and sometimes yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. And that becomes part of your research naturally, because then that alters the tools and the method design, right? You go, wow, that worked. I wonder why. And sometimes that's down to the difference in the person yeah. or the history yeah. or, the, or the situation. So maybe the aim should be slightly help some people understand would have been more achievable. And can you explain some of the times when you did that, when you actually, I'm going to reduce your aim to something yeah. that might be achievable. Yeah. But I'd like you to show that you achieved your aim. So did you help mm. some people understand some of the time? Yeah, it happened for some tools or methods. 
so first of all, uh, the in the in paper five, when I show the matrix complexity scope, uh, one company said, "Okay, I'm actually we are still rush. We are rushing to find new ways to produce our products with R and D. We need our glasses to be flexible but also durable. We are trying to involve the community and, and all these sorts of things." And this, uh, it was R&D manager and operation manager. They said, but how nice it is that we landed in this spot. Systemic was a systemic thinking. And for us, our challenge will be as we grow, as we grow in size, because they're, we're at a sort of, they we're leaving the part, the, the stage of being a startup. We really hope then we don't get a sort of nasty big corporation where everything is structured and we lose this enthusiasm. So in one sense, we need to achieve process repeatability and all these sorts of things that lean production tells us. Uh, but we still want to be systemic and that is gonna be a challenge. And it's good that we, you remind ourselves that this is how we want to, to show up as a, as a company. This is an example. Um, I can add examples as well. Uh, the readiness tool I would say this is something that I actually gained from a person who tried to test it beside, like, uh, outside my understanding of, of the situation and still in the same project where we were in Ecopio Digi. And he said it was actually really helpful for me to talk with the suppliers. Uh, this was a consultant in this project, talk with suppliers and to make sure we covered all the issues so that we could start having a kind of full conversations about sustainable manufacturing, as opposed to just performance improvement. You're jumping ahead about, mm -hmm. just about to my very last question. Mm -hmm. You just answered the last question. Okay. There. Because it, you know, one of the common threads here is that we're trying to bridge a number of languages, a language yes, of sustainability yes. and a language of business and technology. Yes. And that if you can bring a language that helps those people talk with each other sensibly, uh, that can be enormously helpful. I'm breaking my own rule. I was just allowing you a chance to say something good. Right? What about it didn't work? Yeah. When you used your tools and you walked out going, wow, right? I have to start again because yeah. it didn't work today. Yeah. Right? Can you describe what do you think? I mean, that might not have happened because you probably didn't write it up, but I would like you to say, did it happen? And what did you learn? Okay. Um, I would say when that was in the development process of the readiness tool, I understood uh, from, from the impression, not the impression, but the actual what companies uh, uh, middle management especially said, is that uh, I don't know how to use this tool because I'm there, I don't understand what a capability is. You are telling me the definition? I still don't understand. <laughs> Top management got it because I guess it's embedded in the business lingo. And as you said, I'm trying to bring different languages together. So this is what the possibilities, what happens when you bring different domains together and different people together. So. If you choose, if I choose to use a certain language for a certain tool, then it's pretty difficult to include everyone. Um, so yeah, some people in middle management didn't understand, and also when I <coughs> involved them in saying, "Can we try to populate this together?" When it comes to increasing the level of, of readiness, you say, "If you are in level one right now, and we are talking about manufacturing processes, what is a sort of uh, ideal situation, what is for you kind of the best possible state in which you can be in level 11.3 in level when you are ready. And again, if w I found it very exciting to talk to people who are kind of visionary and have ambitious goal and try to use metaphors and all these sorts of things, but with people who are really like with a more technical expertise, I realized that that language didn't work. And I think it's a shame because as I said in the presentation, they are the one who knows, who knows process behavior the most. So we need them on board. Yeah, that was uh, one of the moments. 
I mean, it's often incredibly hard to work in our subject area because when we when we're talking with people about improvement, if we're trying to improve time to design or time to make something, nobody argues about that as a goal. Yeah. And the fact that you as a scientist might have some insight, they will listen carefully. But when you talk about sustainability, it's often perceived as a moral criticism yeah. of their historical behavior. You have been unsustainable for 20 years of your life, and I'm coming along as a young researcher and telling you that you're evil, right? It's not an easy explanation. What's the difference, if you can? Hmm? Is there a difference between the people who listen and the people who don't listen to that? Because I'd like to know, because it's, it's a real problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean if I identify some sort of traits? Some to, secret that, yeah. to, uh, you know, oh, evil people, I'm ah, not going to yeah. talk to them because they are going to take it badly. And if, yeah. if they become defensive, they don't take yeah, action. No, they, right? And yeah, we don't think, want yeah. them to become defensive. Exactly, exactly. That is another, yeah, exactly. Becoming defensive, that is. That so is can you give me yeah. some secrets <laughs> about how to avoid that? Uh, I would say, in my case, it was all trial and error. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if I have to use this knowledge to identify how I can optimize my effort and talk to the right people, so to speak. Um, I think, oh, sorry, I'm trying to think. I mean, normally what I actually do when I want to start a conversation with someone that I never uh, talked to, talk to before is that I look at the internet <laughs> and see, for instance, what kind of conversations they join on LinkedIn, what kind of articles they like. So if there is such a thing as interested in interest in this topic to begin with. Uh, and also, I would say that... So is that like being a salesperson and being a skilled salesperson? Or is that a technical thing about, oh, this person will understand a certain way of presenting things. They like logic in this format. Yeah. So I can... That's different. Right, right, right. One is very much about sort of human empathy, the salesperson skill, very yeah. human, emotional. And the other one is technical language. What's the right technical language? Right. Do you know what you're looking for? Right. When you're searching on LinkedIn, are you looking for technical language or an emotional language? I think uh, my my kind of radar is tuned on the emotional one. And then once I choose the emotional, then I can understand if I look at their job positions, if I look at what they like, what they are motivated by, then it could be easy or not for me to understand a little bit more of their technical background. <coughs> and kind of tune in with their performance or their their motivation. Um, I only, I'm being very selfish. I'm asking those questions because they will help me in, in my research. Uh, I've already said that your journey uh, was quite an interesting one. And on page 10, you've got yeah. the document we should go. Mm -hmm. You should know where I am. Yes. On page 10, 11, you talk about periods like you're an artist. <laughs> No. Well, my po my, post my postmodern period. <laughs> my cubist the blue, period. Yeah, the blue and the pink nice period. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have a blue and pink here, so kind of Picasso right. kind of, yeah. So it's really good that you went through four <laughs> different artistic periods. Um, <laughs> if you were to start again, mm -hmm. if you were crazy enough to yeah. have uh you know, somebody like yourself knock on your door and say, please supervise my PhD. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest they start? Yeah, yeah. Is it still best to start in the quantitative and then learn your way through? Or do you go, no, let's take a shortcut and go to the end yeah. because the end is the best way to do this? I reflected on this question. So, of course, like we cannot say, oh, in retrospect, I would have done the yada yada. But if I would if I was put in that situation, 
I will actually connect this answer with the answer that I gave you before about the empathy and the technicality. So, you know, as you said, like one issue when we go out there and we meet people, the risk is that the other person becomes defensive because they see us as criticizing their model superandi. However, there is also, I think, another issue that I um, encountered, which is the legitimacy the, to talk about something. So how much do you actually know what we are talking about? And if I have to reach technical people, of course they are experts because I don't manage factories, they do. But at least when I talk about KPIs, energy efficiency, machine tools, cutting, milling, drilling, I can tell you, I can tell this person, I know a little bit of this. You know something that I don't know. I know something that you don't know. And this is a kind of click that could uh, can spur a conversation. But if I'm all about feelings and emotions, I mean, then it's maybe I can connect in a short time, but then we need to have something to talk about that keeps this person alive. So I think to answer your question, I'm happy that the journey went in this way because I, I felt that I needed to uh, be knowledgeable about hard technical uh, systems and uh, use this knowledge and allow this transformation to happen as it happened. I think, I, th I think that the apprenticeship as a researcher yeah. often works this way in our subject area. You know, you arrive as a technically competent person and you use your strengths. And then you realize that your strengths are probably not enough to solve your particular research problem. And you have to bring other things in. It, I think it's a very common journey, but not everyone reflects and knows that they've been on it. Um, in one of your sentences, uh, research question two on page four, mm. sorry to jump back. Yeah, oh, no worries. How can manufacturing companies align their operations with their corporate sustainability strategy? Is the assumption there that their corporate sustainability strategy is a good one? Because normally they're yeah. rubbish. So why would you want to align with a piece I, of shit? I reflected on this question because I said, okay, like in the time that I was writing it, I said, like, this is a big leap of faith that they know what they're doing. Um, again, I'm... This is the this was the time where I said, okay, this again is a huge problem, a complex problem, and I can I know that I can fix the alignment of link part. But when it comes to integration of understanding of where they want to go and what are the important issues, their role in society and so forth, I would hope that they have a good board of directors. That and yeah, <laughs> yes, because they they are the only people who can actually bring an external, I would say, pressure in leading in a different way from the way they led. And I'm confident enough that if the ESG investing would actually be mainstream, then the right the corporate strategy that actually is helpful for the 12 goal will actually be there at some point. Would your framework help me develop a better corporate sustainability strategy? I started with the issue in uh, in the GAT about the development of an integrated corporate uh, sustainability strategy. I would say you can get a sort of compass with the complexity and scope, uh, but with the development as such, I would say the framework helps as long as you focus on the resources that you have already, because I use the resource-based theory of the firm. That is a good start, and again, it's an easy start, because you know what you have, and you know what you're strong, and you know what you have to improve. But if the goal is to develop a, a, a good corporate strategy, then I would actually use a different approach. I would use a different theory. I would use the stakeholder theory. I would use the stakeholder theory if we look, for instance, at how what kind of investors we want to attract, long-term investors in this case. So yeah, other approaches, I would say. Um, I think you're being weak. 
I actually think your tool can help because it's the development of corporate sustainability strategies in manufacturing-led mm -hmm. companies where there are intensive flows of materials and energy and water. Um, often takes the production process as being more fixed in its performance than it actually is. Mm -hmm. So their, um, their level of ambition in their target about what they might be able to do in the next 10 years or five years is diminished because actually the people writing the sustainability strategies don't understand the manufacturing well enough mm -hmm. to understand how flexible it might be. That's right. my observation. Yeah. You're not studying that, but I yeah. actually yeah. believe that your tools can help by showing what manufacturing could do, then that can change the corporate sustainability strategy. I'm being nice to you, I have to stop. <laughs> um, on page 16, and I'm happy that you referred to strong versus weak sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see strong sustainability in any of your case no. companies? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the the company or the, I think it's called Penny L that I put in my company cases. So basically this company start with a startup and I would say maybe hopefully startup now have a wrong uh, uh, kind of broader understanding of what um, not understanding but implicitly, they want to address more systemic issues than just kind of securing uh, the, the, the profitability of the company. So basically this company was about using recyclable, uh, sorry, uh, used plastic to build modular eyeglasses frame. And basically what they do is to find, a, they are trying to find a good formula to have both a long uh, product use phase but also be flexible enough. Basically, you can actually squeeze the the, the eye the eyeglasses frame. They, they don't break, but they are durable enough. And in doing so, they are trying to really include, uh, for instance, local communities on board to build the, the, the case uh, with also other waste material. They are taking the glasses with a kind of extremely cheap price, a very kind of Fordish like model, like just one model with child and other side are going to the art back in Australia. I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop you. Basically, yeah. you're saying that companies that start with sustainability at the core of their thinking have sustainability at the yeah, core of their yeah, thinking. Yeah, it's a kind of, yeah, yeah, I understand. It's circular. Right. Yes. Right, they've yeah. already started that way. They already have that And I think that yeah. the really interesting question, yeah. the big question, big question for society, yeah. not for your research, is how do we get strong sustainability thinking happening more frequently in bigger scale, so in incumbent organizations? Yes, yes. Because they're the ones that are doing quite a lot of stuff at the moment. Yeah? Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. I thought of this question as well. Uh, <laughs> since we talked about the information deficit model before, we all know that it's already difficult enough in some cases to achieve local improvement and where they are, they are not doing that. But when but it comes, when comes to some strong sustainability, some common sense, I think probably the things that you cannot do much money I think, I think only, only internalizing costs, costs of the international activism is very important in the stem Kind of external and non mind 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 non mind mind pressure, like the science based target. This could be something that we have to evoke in place of the strong sustainability. Yeah. You're not trying to deliver that, so that's a bigger conversation. We can have that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. On the very bottom sentence of page 20. So you're referring to. Uh, Gotowski mm -hmm. says cutting energy accounts for less than 15% of the yeah. total energy. And that's the energy of the machine tool, right? Not the energy for warming the factory or no, cleaning no. or any of the other things. And on page 78, you have a loss-based model for yeah. OEE. Yeah. So does that mean that the green 
<laughs> should be 15 <laughs> percent yes yeah. yes i didn't uh, put it in the right scale but i mean of course i I didn't measure it. Uh, Gutowski performed that measurement, those measurements in Toyota, I think. Um, but yeah, normally it's around. So there days. are some necessary energies we need to pump. Yes, yes. Fluids yeah. around, so you need a pump. They're very often massively oversized. And exactly, exactly. We might come back to that when we come to page 78, because mm -hmm. I think this is a really important diagram, and it's often about the scale. Right. When the way you've drawn it is too yeah, kind, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to suggest. Right. Um, so, what should our target be? If that research says only 15% of the energy is mm -hmm. actually making money, mm -hmm. what's the non-value-add energy? 85%. Mm -hmm. How should how far should we try and reduce that 85%? In most, let's let's take the very very specific. Yeah. In cutting processes, right? milling and turning, uh, how far should we be trying to go really? I'm just asking mm. personal opinion. Mm. Uh, I would say that by using this indicator, you can understand whether something happens accidentally or whether there is a common pattern of problems. So it could be that, for instance, we have our repeated issues in, in maintenance. And if you find repeatability of something, then I said there is a structure of issues, not randomness. But also you have to weight this occurrence with the amount of energy that it takes. So to if you have to restart the machine again, it takes quite some energy. But at the same time, if... You're practicing the lazy answer of uh, an engineering manager who doesn't want to change the world. Are you not? You've heard that answer so many times yeah. that you're passing it on as the yeah. truth, right? You're a researcher, you know better. What should the target be? Stop apologizing for their stupidity. What should the target be? Fifteen percent is you. Yeah. How far do you think we could actually in cutting processes so that we get on the tiny that we need to get on yeah. because the outside world needs it should we you mentioned three percent earlier yeah yeah do you think we should aim three percent well as i said three percent in the process industry is meaningful i'm not sure how meaningful it is so in here in milling and turning yeah what do you think would be a good five-year target, say? Five-year target, okay. If you got the job, you're the factory manager, knowing everything you now know, you would go in with a personal target. You might not tell anyone on day one because it mm. might be too challenging yeah. to do that. What would your personal... I'm happy after five years if we reach X. What's the number? Let's say if, I don't have data to back this up, but if you have in, so the ideal, first of all, to update everyone, the ideal uh, measurement of this indicator is one. So this means that you have valuable energy that is 100%. If, for instance, you shut down the plan for summer vacation, so to speak, you have, of course, a little bit of energy when you start the, the plant again. You're doing excuses again. Okay. Give me a number. Okay. Give so me a it's number. One. <laughs> it's one. It should be all valuable energy. No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Okay. I want you to be a proper production okay. manager. Right? Okay. <laughs> You've actually got to take people on this journey with you. This is yes. a theory. I'm interested in how far you think you can push in okay, a real factory. Okay, okay I understand. You know, it's, it's, it seems to me that 3% is not enough and 85% is too much, but that still gives you quite a lot of space. Yes, yes. So how far would you think you can get in five years? In five years, I know from the research that we do here in our department that we have a visual of... Uh, vision of a uh, failure free production with predictive maintenance for instance so hopefully this block can go away in five years 
So 85, you're still coming back with 85%. There is another block with uh, quality as well. Uh, in five years, I believe that everything that is happening in the digital twin to improve the accuracy of the products and also developing new algorithms to uh, understand product design a little bit better will, can also be reduced. I would say the most difficult challenge is probably to reduce the speed losses. Because then the true, the downtime and the quality, management has con more control, is their sphere of control. But when it comes to speed losses, it could be because of poor production scheduling, but it also could be because you don't have the, the material, the right material, which didn't arrive from your supplier. So it's a little bit more challenging because... You're doing it again. Okay. It's, this is a really easy thing. Tell me a number. Tell me a number. Oh, God. Remember, I am not going to come back in five years and check. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not because of the check. It's, I'm trying to understand the, the model in which I can. So come it's up a balance the... between theoretically possible. Yeah. We know that's easy. And I'm really interested because you're the subject matter expert. And I'm really interested in how far you think if somebody was in, if one of these places became interested in some yeah. strong sustainability, how far, how fast, how far could, do how you think they could get in five years? I don't want to kill this one because it's really not part of your thesis. I'm personally yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you the answer. You should be halfway between the two, at least. Yeah, at the yeah, very at least. least halfway between the if two. If 85% is feasible, you've got to be doing better than 42.5%, right? Reduction in five years. Mm. That's hard, really yeah. hard. But you've still only. You've still got half the losses still to go, so it should actually be achievable. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to get answer the question for you because you are really resisting this. Have you noticed? I right. think I'm a little bit uncomfortable in giving a number if I cannot calculate the likelihood of something to happen. Yeah, but, but I, I, I hope I was clear. Yeah, I was yeah, asking I understand. Your opinion. I understand your. Can I go to question. page thirty? When I first read the heading of the name of this section 234, I wrote a rude comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you've locked your answer into your question because you've used yeah, the word uh, maturity and capability in the heading. Can you try and explain to me and assure me that that's a consequence of writing it at the end of the research rather than the answer was already built into the way right. that you phrased the question? So we are page 30, right? On when page I just, 30, yeah. the top line, the, yeah. the title yeah, yeah. locks in a particular type of solution uh, rather than being an open-ended op opportunity for yeah. multiple ways of solving this to come. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I was too narrow in my framework reference. Also because, as you can see, I didn't jump directly with paper 7, with the readiness model. There was, as I said, the fundamental question, what is sustainable manufacturing to you? And now we can create taxonomies when we talk about sustainability strategies. So, yeah, uh, I realized that in order for me to validate this capability maturity approach, I still need to have some sort of background knowledge about what we are trying to assess first. So, yeah, it was bad title, I think. That's really helpful because we're really interested in changing practice. We know that to improve practice, um, we can bring a new technology. We can sometimes bring simply a new cognitive insight, but nearly all of our work, research around the world, comes through tools and methods. Right? So that's the sort of number one solution. But the tools and methods are based on some insight. Yes. Right? So I'm interested in what insight, what did you learn from your interviews, mm. focus groups, etc., which led you to choosing the maturity model okay. approach. Okay. Yes, What's yes. What's the root cause insight? Right, right. So the idea um, a little bit can be explained by what I said in, now I don't remember the num number of the slides, but it was 
We talk about mismatch, we talk about there is no communication, that the message gets lost in the operation, uh, how can we make it quantifiable? So I knew that I was trying to build something that encapsulate in a sort of proxy quantitative measurement, something that is qualitative. So that was the, the thinking be behind that. When it comes to the specific approach or the specific tool, I really like the mental picture of a roadmap. I mean, I know that if I say that I want to go from zero to two and I know what the intermediate steps are and I know that they are achievable, they are already plotted there. It looks like something ambitious, ambitious but achievable. And I know the steps uh, in uh, the, the different intermediate level. So the idea is to give them the, uh, give the users the, the idea of a roadmap. You haven't, An evolution. you haven't used the word roadmap I didn't, in the yeah. thesis, yeah. but what you mean is progression. Progression, and exactly. Attaching numbers to progression. Yes. Oh, I go from naught to one, yeah. or from bronze to silver to gold, yes. or from nothing to green belt to black yeah. belt, or whatever it is, exactly. seem, seems to offer people points of assessment on something that is actually a journey and may be <laughs> never ending, but that's very confusing. Right. But you said, I like it. Yeah. You said, I like a roadmap. Yeah. Are you making yourself representative of your study? Yeah, I understand what The you're organizations you're studying. Are you designing a tool for yourself or is this based on an insight that they like it? <laughs> they like tools of this sort. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, again, there are organizations that use roadmap and others and then don't. Uh, I believe that having the, the graphical picture of a journey is better than not having anything at all if other valid alternatives are not there. Um, can you repeat me the question? I'm well, not sure uh, I'm you know, the, the the journey, left to right, yes. at least in a Western tradition, yeah. <laughs> um, with scores and steps right. and names for stages. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that overall graphical image is used in many tools in many yeah. parts of life. Um, so you might argue that it probably exists because it might even work. Right. Otherwise, people are repeating something that doesn't work. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You, you'd hope that they're not repeating it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think that your instinctive preference for that type of graphical image is in part based on your education and your history, which is similar to the education and history of the people you're working with. Right, right. You've got an engineering management education. You like pictures like that. You need to test, do they like pictures like that? Is that what you're testing when you put pictures in front of them? How does the focus groups work to test ideas like that? Uh, I can tell you that I noticed in, so this tool was developed with six companies in choices, and that was unexpected. And I think I also wrote it in the thesis some of them, without me asking to do this sort of exercise, and now we are, let's say, level two, and but our target is level three. And I believe that in this other area, we could be level five, level three, for instance, level four, for instance. So they did it indirectly. I didn't ask them to to envision the the next level that they that they want to be. Uh, but again, is this so, is there any counter evidence right, from right. the case studies where people went, I don't understand your don't, picture? Yeah. You know, it's cognitively confusing. Yeah. I would say, no, I unfortunately I didn't design the survey to judge, to make the intended users judge the outlook of the tool. But for sure, a repeated problem was that they don't understand what they were supposed to evaluate. What does it mean that I have to understand how proficient or how ready I am in pollution prevention? It's, it's such a complicated concept. 
So it was the input to the tool that was uh, <laughs> something very abstract. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's an architecture to the visual tool, mm -hmm. the idea that from left to right is yeah. progress, that there are steps right. and stages with names. Those, those, that's a very common architecture. The specific naming and how do you test that you as an organization have exactly achieved level 3.00? Um, that's down to detail, right. right? So you get lots of feedback on detail, but do mm. you get feedback on the, sh the overall architecture of the tool that, that people have reacted to the tool and I'm completely confused. What do you mean by a maturity model? Mm. Or did people just start working with it? Because if they started working with it, then it's probably understood. Yeah. They just mm. gone on with it. Yeah. Right. And that would be the sort of evidence that, in fact, the architecture was appropriate. Right. They got on with it. And then they were criticizing detail because they could position detail within the whole because it worked. Sorry. I see. Yeah. That, that was yeah. not a question. No, no, but I, I understand what you mean. Uh, yes, yeah, some, uh, especially in focus groups, they jumped in it. It was also interesting for me to see the discussion of the different understanding of where we are right now. Uh, and that is the benefit of including uh, people with different positions and different roles. Um, I would say that in another case, it was just an interview with the, the C. He, he made a point saying, I understand that this is an evolution, but you're talking about maturity. And for me, it is difficult to have a sort of baseline of target or where I am mature and what is the what is the target, what, what does it mean to target of being mature and where I'm starting. So I think his point was about I need some sort of incremental difference that tells me where are we starting quantitatively. I, trying to remember I didn't capture this well enough uh, if that sort of ideal archetype that my tool didn't really express but I think we also lost the message that I wanted him to be part of that <laughs> at the same time so it's a common criticism yeah. the people ask not so much about the steps, but yeah, the end yeah, yeah, exactly. statement of maturity. Who decides th that yeah. that is perfection? Yeah, exactly. Because actually it's a journey and there's probably ages after that. Right. Just not drawing them because it's quite stressful yeah. to do that. It is also a common criticism or desire, request. Please, can you make this numerical so that it is a... a care if it's a composite score but mm -hmm. I'd like a number so that I can tell them that I'm at 1.95 today and 1.96 next month by measurement and actually capability maturity models are about debate they're about people sitting together deciding yes, yes. this is where we are as an organization and that seems and those are very different framing one is a very qualitative way of talking about where we are and one but the desire to be quantitative is well documented in that mm. literature. There's lots of people ask for it and people do try to build them, but I don't know of many successes. Mm. Uh, can I jump to page 46? Yes. I just want to check something. Uh, under the structured interviews for in the top paragraph, mm. you list a whole bunch of data that you collected without mm. referring to energy. <laughs> Right. Did you collect energy yeah. data? Yeah. <laughs> I did collect energy data for the uh, optical sorter machine, and that was in the Excel tool. Yeah, but that, uh, okay. that okay. wasn't. I yeah. Just, yeah, no, but it, it's important. That I, yeah, that I, I was a bit surprised at that one. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to some of these. Yeah. I'm already running out of time. Is that right? Yeah, just long time as you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you really don't want that, right? I've been going about fifty, about fifty minutes. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, I'm not too rushed, but I have. I also know how many more I've got. <laughs>
Um, I like your little picture on page 62. Mm -hmm. And you sort of referred to it in your presentation. Yes. Uh, and I was asking myself the question, so I'm hoping you can help me answer it. Is the logic a sort mm. of the way that it would work in a real mm. life organization to bring about change, that it's a top down system where you solve the alignment problem, then you look at the assessment of technologies. Mm. So you start with strategy and then sort of tactics and technology and then operations or is it the other way around you just start cleaning up and stop doing stupid stuff in the factory and then move to strategy yeah yeah that's a valid question because i was also a little bit conflicted on about the way i should put these layers because as we saw in the presentation the order was strategic tactic operational but of course i mean if i decide to put in these ways because I want to communicate a message of why it is relevant and important to look at the organizational uh, organizational uh, hierarchy. Um, I would say, as I also mentioned in the presentation, the way for, and now I'm not talking about something that comes from the data from the test, but for a sort of sense making of what I did is I think there is a lot of benefit in starting with a big picture and understand where the hotspots are. So the readiness tool, for instance, and, uh, and as I said, stay in the operation once the big, uh, uh, the big hotspot is removed, a sort of theory and constraint approach, as I was saying, and start kind of gaining momentum or encouragement that we address the big problem so now everything else is, will be much easier to, to be addressed. And then look at uh, something bolder to do technology-wise. But at the same time, I think that this approach works as long as you look at what happens in your factory or company only, because as I said, we had a big goal and we need to do this together with our, with our competitors, with our customers, with our supplier. So there is a time dimension of sustainability that is not present in this framework. I didn't design the third dimension of time. Um, so a, a, criteria, a criterion that could be used to selecting the flow or the tool is that how fast and how effective we can get there. And that could also change the flow, but I will still start with the strategy in level one. On the bottom of the opposite page, you talk about doing it in one, three, two as a sequence. Luckily, you've just been consistent with yourself. Mm. But you just make me think of something that mm. we very often, um, part of the background way we think about how the world works mm. allows individual businesses to be separate organizations, separate to society mm. and the world. And in that environment, organizations, people, don't vote for s stressful change. Their preference is mm. slow, steady change, mm. because it's less stressful. Mm. If things like the climate crisis situation mm. increase, and governments start to take things incredibly seriously, yeah. that will change the context for manufacturing, yeah. right? So let's imagine a world where all of a sudden, all the CEOs are in the president's office and it's like, come on, we've got to sort something out today. Would your framework still be of value in such an energetic, you know, we really need yeah. to get something done yeah. environment? Or do we have to throw away all of our tools because all of our tools are designed for a sort of incremental world? Mm -hmm. uh, I understand what you mean. Uh, I think that if 
if this model is adopt is, is scalable as i said in the presentation so if the whole industry start thinking in this way then then what would happen in a crisis situation is that they would start talking about what type of improvements we want to what kind of strategy we have and for in, and what kind of values are we putting in our strategy are we all systemic or we want to be still in the old school deep down so to speak so still reflecting on on, on the value embedded in the business i think it's a it's a relevant uh, start uh, and also what I also tried to com try, I conveyed in the presentation is that when we talk about improvements, um, it's not that all incremental improvements are bad, but to which extent the improvements that we are focusing is really material to the, to the, to the business operations and the, environmental, and the environmental impact of the whole business. So is it something that is, impacts not only the factory, but the whole product life cycle and how to which, I, and this is something that I can talk about, but I cannot model in my tool, to which extent is this business operation eroding a safe operating space, so to speak? How fast we can actually run up with an ideal quota that we don't have yet in the corporate world uh, to, to make it happen. So definitely it's a good, it's a start to start, it's a framework to start having a conversation in different players. But again, as I said before, there is also a component of external pressure that uh, that should kick in at some point. I think you're suggesting that the tools would work, but if I set targets to be at, yes. level, to be at yes. level three by 2035, versus to be at level three by 2021. Exactly, the time is, is dimension. It varied, it then changes things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Okay. I mean, I don't know, because we haven't tested it. We There's haven't no tested evidence it. That exactly, that's true. I exactly, just to, exactly. To There's explore no that. Evidence. But we have the Parkinson law that says that, uh, like, we extend our effort according to the timeline that we set ourselves. So there is, if there is no time, no deadline at all, then things can only go go worse. But if we set a challenging timeline, then uh, we do our best to fulfill it. To sorry, deadline. I mean, yeah. Um, on page sixty-nine, you've got a picture of the sustainability readiness mm -hmm. score and the model. How easy is it? in your uh, cases, how easy was it to get agreement about where to put uh, the dot? Uh, um, so in as the, for the user of the tool, they do it individually in a certain company and their results are aggregated. So they actually don't talk to each other in the development of the tool. When I actually said, you need to give me a number now. Um, I would say, depending on some issues, for instance, when it comes to IT information systems, like that it was easy that everybody complained about that. <laughs> so they didn't manage to find the data. If a customer called the day and a certain person is missing, I say, oh, I cannot access to this piece of data. I don't know what to say about the customer. So some issues were really kind of pervasively good or pervasively bad. Um, when it, but however, like, I think it depends also on... Uh, so in your data set, yeah. what was the variety of answers? The vari yeah, yeah. Um, so when I, <coughs> I would say, when I developed the tool, the, I didn't calculate the variety of answer in the tool development. Of course, I analyzed, like I took a screenshot of the, what we draw, what they draw in the whiteboard, but the, for me, what was more relevant is how they discussed the number as such. Uh, but I, that was an interesting, what you say about the convergence, the rate of convergence to a number is an interesting point, I think. Uh, but no, I, I, I don't have a sort of figures. For sure, some issues were straightforwardly good or bad. Yeah. 
but others ah, were a little bit of variabilities, I think. But at the I mean, same there, time... There have been some studies on the process. The, yeah. And it is very common for people to do it by survey first. So they put down their own number, but then they debate. Why right. did you choose three and I chose one? Because that's really right. quite a big difference. And there's literature which suggests mm. that the conversation helps people understand other people's situations. Exactly. Strangely okay. enough. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to 77. We're going to get back to energy. The energy consumed in making saleable products. Mm -hmm. This thing about what is necessary energy. I've, I've introduced that word because I don't want to use your language. I want you to use your language yeah. to explain how do you calculate the green in the picture. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because the way it's calculated at the moment, you start with an actual energy quantity. Yes. And then you take off four losses. Yeah. That then leaves you with a number. Yeah. Is that the actual minimum energy to produce that part? Mm, mm. Or is it the first number, take away four numbers? It's a random number. That's my worry. Because it it doesn't reach uh, Gotovsky's 15% potentially. Yeah. Which is a number that's worked upwards from... Mm, from what you measure, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's say that I adopted the schema, the scheme, so to speak, of the OEE. So you kind of go by removing losses to achieve something valuable. But I guess your question is that, could you go further than that? Is this really the, the yeah, the valuable energy? Um, so if, if you talk about the energy in a refrigerating, mm -hmm. you know, keeping food cold, how you alter the set points right. will change the total amount of energy right. that that refrigerator is using. The food quality remains the same. Okay. I don't know which category that would fall under. You know. I think it's still lost in the valuable energy, probably. Yeah. So I think I can find lots of examples where there are industrial practices, best energy efficiency practices, which don't fit easily into your four, and trying to force fit them in is one mechanism. Mm. But, but I, I would encourage helping people to do a bottom-up way of thinking. Is right, like, what is the right. minimum energy it takes to keep your right. food cold, and what's the actual energy it takes? Because the point about the Gotowski paper is fifteen percent, hundred percent. It's supposed to make people go, right? Oh, ooh, ooh, there's a lot of money I'm wasting potentially that I can work with. Yes, yes. And I thought the whole concept of lean is based on understanding what is the minimum exactly, required. Exactly, exactly. I not would say, yeah. what are the four most stupid things we do and can we stop doing them? Right. Yes, I agree. <coughs> on page 84, this is a helpful table. Mm -hmm. You talk about the evaluation of the quality mm -hmm. of research, really, not of the assessment framework. You're using... Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the methodology and yeah. the tactics and so forth, yeah. And I found it a bit strange that you had, for example, high credibility Mm -hmm. under the naturalistic term mm -hmm. of truth value, but internal validity was not even applicable mm. on the left-hand side. So yeah. you didn't give yourself much scientific credit. I would say, yeah. Am I reading it wrongly? Mm. No, no, you are not reading wrongly. I would say since the framework has is basically qualitative in nature, although there are some quantitative tools, I would say that according to this uh, scheme of uh, evaluation of the quality of the research, credibility was a fairer way to, to, to describe the um, truth value of the framework. So it's a, cho it's a choice of language as opposed to, oh, I don't think it's internally valid. 
I think you're being a bit of an engineer here. Mm. The average social scientist would claim science in their title, social scientist, yeah, yeah. and would argue for internal validity Validity's from the same sets of data, same types of data that you're saying don't apply. Right. You're, you are coming from a quantitative world, yeah. and I think you're applying quantitative views. <laughs> yes. Yes. to qualitative data yes. and going, oh, it's not as good. And actually what they've done is develop research methods to ensure that internal validity does arise. And you've followed those methods and then you've not allowed yourself to make the claim because you're being a very safe engineer. Yeah, right? I was precautious, yeah. I think you should have been a bit more brave and actually claimed some on the left-hand side. <laughs> Can you see the worry as an external examiner? I'm going, well, none of these are applicable. That's you trying to dodge the bullet, right? No, they must be applicable. Right? Otherwise, you can't have done good research. Right? You've not done good science. And I think you have done okay, right? So. If you were to write this with a bit more confidence, I think you would change <coughs> what you've written on the right-hand side. So, let's have a test. We're not, I'm not going to let you get away with saying internal validity doesn't apply to qualitative research. Right? So how does it apply in your case? Mm -hmm. How do you know that the results you've obtained from using your tools and the insights you've obtained from using your tools are valid within your research. So I would test by saying, test the internal validity by saying that if I apply this assessment framework in, so depending on the claim that I'm putting forward and the claim is that this assessment framework uh, has tools and methods to assess sustainability performance of production system and hopefully conveys a new mindset about how to think of the problem. I, I would, try to test it in, I would, pretending that I'm kind of five years fast forward, I would propose the model again to see if it actually would still... The, but what have you already done? Yeah. You, you want to know that your tool works and helps. Yes. So what evidence did you use? To mm -hmm. make that judgment. Yeah, yeah. So the evidence that I would use to make that judgment is that, again, the thing, uh, bringing, bringing back the claim is that the management, management has been not to the rest of the That's not any help. It's obvious on making the main thing understand. So, so if they think self selfishness has taken the data to the understand, that's evidence. That's evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, of course they know they you. Know they know that you're very invested in, in your ideas. ideas. So, so having already invited you into their organization, and they know that you're a nice person, if you give them a questionnaire saying, did my research help you? They always say yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you didn't do that, and I'm really glad you didn't do that. <laughs> So you're looking for pieces of evidence yes. that can add up to that. Are you also looking for pieces of evidence that it didn't mm. work? How hard do you have to work to look for the negative evidence, the counter evidence that shows you're not valid? Mm. So where do you go looking for that? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Very good question. You've already given me an example yeah. of some places where the responses maybe were not what you hoped for. 
Yeah. Which is, so basically a, a test to falsify the, the validity of the approach. I don't know if I can put it this way. So kind of devil's advocate, so to speak, this is what I mean, uh, is by saying, but by having a feedback that says, I clearly understand what you are trying to do with this model and this tool and this approach and so forth is not work, it's not gonna change the situation. It's got, not gonna help us go into the goal. You, but then I'm trying to- You're creating a very high cognitive standard for your subjects, right? They have yeah. to understand your right. research in right. order to right. tell you that it doesn't work, right? right? Yeah. yeah. But you've given an example, we were talking about the maturity model, Yes. where some, where you were providing evidence that yeah. somebody didn't like it in a particular way. Yes, right? yes. So it's the very deliberate search for when it's not exactly. working exactly. that you've already shown that you're doing. Yes. I'm answering your question. Yeah. It's really no, no, not I fair. understand. I understand what you mean. Uh, definitely. Well, I think it's a little bit easier if I make actually concrete examples. Uh, what I realize when I look at the literature and maturity models, and also when I design mine, is that not everything is linear and incremental. As we know, there could be big transformations. So maybe the entire validity could be compromised when we have a sort of crisis situation where a linear approach wouldn't work anymore and maybe used to work before. I think you've got to be more, answer the question as you were talking about an experiment. Right, right. Right, because you're talking about a case and the scientific language is mm. that's evidence that yeah. can hold against this test. Yes. And the, the test for is this a truth in, in my cases? Um, you have to deliberately go out of your way mm. to check that mm. it isn't a truth. And one of the biggest problems in our world is that you represent your own research. And the people that we work with, most of them are not psychopaths. So actually, they want to tell you that you're doing really well. So you can't rely on asking the direct question. Yeah. Is yeah. my research helping you? Because they always say yeah. yes. Yeah. So how do you look behind yeah. that question? Yeah. How did you check? Yeah, yeah. See what you mean. Behind the politeness, you actually think that you got the truth. How did you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I have to think. Again, if if I involve another group of people to test the maturity model, for instance, a um, what could emerge that is not reflected currently in the tool could be that there is an intermediate state between the two levels that I didn't grasp, or that this doesn't help them see performance improvement because it's because we still need some sort of connection between what they reach, what they obtain through the score, and what they have to do afterwards. Uh, so a possible test could be, first of all, are there other layers that I'm missing here? Are four levels enough to describe the complexity to a good enough level to what we are trying to achieve? And also, to which extent having a score two with the standard deviation and this variation really tell you what to do. Is that intuitive? Maybe for me it is because I studied each dimension carefully, but maybe I cannot claim that this is a tool because they need something else to, to understand the value of, what, uh, of the results. When it doesn't work as mm -hmm. well as you hope, do you run away? No. 
I, what do you do? I, I ask them to tell me more about why it doesn't work. That's the answer to the question. That's all I've been asking for. It's really that simple. We don't run away when the experiment fails mm. because we need to understand. Yeah. Right? And you're looking for negative information. Right, right. With more care than positive. Positive is exactly. easier to find. Exactly. Right? And the willingness to stay in when things are not working is why you have internal validity in large part. Right. right? That's <laughs> boil it down. Yes. Right? Yes. Don't run away. Bad data. Yes. Um, we're nearly at the end. Can you remind me? Because this, you would, I hope you've practiced for this question. What is your contribution to knowledge? You do want me to ask it, because otherwise you'll be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, contribution to knowledge. I reflected on this question because since I developed tools that are meant to use for in, in the practice, I reflected on what do I mean by contribution to knowledge, if this is theoretical novelty as opposed to how much we can, uh, what is the value in usefulness on what we are producing and to which extent we can actually bring them outside academia. And sometimes, I mean, this is a decision that as a researcher we want to make, that we have to make. So if the tool is really valuable and applicable and uh, is uh, met with positively in the company, then of course, at some point, I guess it will commercialize, will be kind of make it commercial, open source, whatever it is. And then it goes away from, from, from research. It leaves a sort of, it leaves an environment when it's not novel anymore. And what I try to do is to actually bring them closer to practice. So you're doing it again. <laughs> you're avoiding the hard question. Yes, yes. Can, ah, okay. can I yes. rephrase it? The contribution to practice is well presented in the thesis. Mm -hmm. I think you've done something very smart in saying, I'm going to contribute to research. That's the title of the section on yes, page 102. Yes. You didn't say contribution to knowledge. You said contribution to research. Because your legacy for other researchers is the tool set. Yes. Wow. So you change practice by having a framework which within it has methods and tools. Yes. They are based on insights about what works and what doesn't work yes. under which conditions. Keep that sentence. Yes. What works and what doesn't work under which conditions. Those are the insights you've been using to design yeah. the tools. Yeah. Those insights are the contributions to knowledge. Now I'm going to ask you the question mm. again. Yeah. What are the insights that you found yeah. that helped you design these tools these ways? Right, right. I would say when you try to decide where, which example should I make? Um, yeah, pick one. Pick, pick your best. Okay, okay, okay. Your best insight. You went. I was surprised when I learned this, but that helped me make the tool look like this. Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, uh, the first paper that I produced, which actually is paper two, that come, came from my master thesis. Uh, I, uh, my co-author and I made this kind of very kind of complex uh, kind of Russian doll of different indicators with a lot of kind of different powers and energy. And I said, well, it's a mm, kind of very detailed mathematical model. Uh, but if we have to implement it in simulation as we did it with paper one, I cannot <laughs> use it. I mean, this gives me gives me a sort of mathematical language to describe the indicator, but we had to simplify and boil it down to a simple form. So that was one realization, maybe what is 
mathematically beautiful and, and complex so with the right level of complexity really doesn't doesn't apply to practice. So the insight the accuracy yeah. Yeah. comes at a resource cost. Exactly. Is not your insight. I'm afraid that's yeah, been written yeah, before. Yeah, yes, right? clearly. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So what's what your you mean. insight? Yeah. Yeah. So when I developed the readiness model from an existing model, the, con the one with the money at all in NIST as a kind of baseline, um, what, I, what I understood is that I, I actually it's on the same level as the description that I was drawing before, like having I think you want something like ex examples of what happened as opposed to level of complexity and accuracy and so forth. I'm not sure in which level of abstraction shall I describe what I what I gain. Um, you may have got your insight initially by reading about yes, stuff. And yes. you, you took an idea from another subject and you started to apply that idea to your subject. So effectively, your insight is that idea, which is not a new idea, does work in my field. Right. Okay, so it can be a statement of yeah, that sort. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Or it can be, in the first part of my research, I think your big yellow star yeah, yeah, they, is they, a moment they, of insight. Light. Yeah, exactly. Just explain. Exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. You know, all of a sudden I found that there were variables that were important that I was not dealing yes, with. Yes, That's a form of insight and that potentially is a contribution to knowledge. That's what I'm trying to drive to. I see. Uh, definitely, I can kind of attach to that uh, yeah, yellow explosion moment. And also, another insight which actually motivated and justified the research question too was that when we talk about measurements indicators, there are a lot of value systems included into them. And that, again, we need to bring to, to as a researcher, we need to recognize management as the, the key actor in, in this transformation. And the challenge that I faced and that I sol tried to solve with the readiness tool is that what is the best way to bring and systematize this knowledge from different people, but but also come back iteratively to the literature and see what actually has been proved to affect performance as opposed to be what they believe it is. So yeah, this is the, the contribution is. So I'm, I've got a last question. Yeah. I'll make a point on this one. Um, I believe that if you had freedom, so away from the thesis, mm -hmm. I think that your your decision to call it contribution to research is a very smart decision. But if in the PowerPoint I said, I want a contribution to knowledge with insights on it, I think you would be able to do that. Right? But I do think it would be a good exercise to push yourself to do that. It might be helpful. My last question is a very open question. For, so I'm going to ask you what you want to ask me. Right? Um, you might want to complain that there was a question you expected that you practiced for and you have a beautiful answer to and I didn't ask. So it could be, please ask me this question. Um, or you could just comment. So you have a very small moment here to put me under pressure before I disappear. And this is your last moment. So ask questions or make a point and you could make the point to the committee or the audience through me, through this opportunity. Mm. Right? Okay. Otherwise, I'm gone. Okay. Oh. Um. <sighs> I'm trying to reflect because you asked many of the questions that I was 
expecting. And I mean, normally <laughs> the other questions that the PhD candidate prepared is what science was a theory, what is a fact, what is an evidence and all sorts of things. Uh, but I think we explored with the validity test and contribution to knowledge. So that is taken care of, I think. Um, <laughs> sometimes what I saw from other uh, previous defenses or vivas was uh, how would you use this knowledge for the future after, after your PhD? That's always a kind question at the yeah. end, you know. <laughs> um, We almost demand it as part of our politeness, but I'm assuming one of the committee will do that. Yeah, yeah, I think I so I don't too. want to get a reputation for politeness. <laughs> All right. So I should, okay, so I kind of, yeah. Tricky question that you could have asked and you didn't. It, oh. don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that. No, I'm, this, is a, this is the one opportunity that, that is unstructured. You can say anything you like, and you, including, can we stop now? Okay, okay, I understand. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I have to find inspiration. Um, I see the value of this opportunity, so I just that my. You don't have to take it, right? No, but I want to take it. But I. So while you're doing that, I'm going to tell the audience why this is particularly horrible. It seems a very pleasant question. No, you carry on. Yeah. <laughs> you're working. Um, it seems like a very pleasant question, you know, what do you want to ask of us? Uh, but the reason I ask it is that asking questions that people are not prepared for is what makes us observe their thinking processes. And that's part of what we're testing for today. Do they really understand their subject? Do they really understand the difference between good research and average and bad research? because that's the final test of a PhD candidate. If they pass, they will have a license to do the same thing that we are doing to people, which is to supervise their PhDs and mess up their lives. Right? <laughs> and you've got to be able to tell the difference between good research and bad research to be that good teacher of researchers. So being clear about the way that you think is important. And that's what I've been pushing throughout this. And want to give you a last opportunity to show that you're a good thinker, really. No pressure. <laughs> I never thought this was going to be the most difficult. Oh, by the way, I refrain from the personal. Um, Ilaria is a warrior. Right. Have you noticed? Uh, she worries too much. And part of this process, I hope, will give you some confidence that actually you're a good thinker and you should trust yourself sometimes to say what comes to your head first and not overthink it and overthink it and wait for perfection to appear in your head because maybe your first answer would have been a very good answer. Right. But I do honestly, you're a warrior. Look at you. God. I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna put you out of pressure. I'm done. You don't didn't have to answer that, right? You have done a really good job of dealing with my horrible questions. I'm really sorry. I did not intend to make you cry. No, no, no. This is really terrible of me. I am now immensely guilty and <laughs> being British, I will probably resign from my job, <laughs> right? Or at least leave the European Union. <laughs> I'm going to make my last comment. Um, I've enjoyed this process. Now I'm going to leave you alone to the three nice people. Do you need to?
Thank you. Thank you very much. For your Can you hear me now? So now we will um, proceed to um, have the questions from the audience and, and primarily from the grading committee. So would you like to start? Thank you. Can you hear me? Is uh, for the streaming. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So maybe you could start by explaining some of the key terms you are yes. using yes. in the thesis. So maybe actually you can scroll yes. back the presentation to I think the first slide where you have the title. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was catching the word sustainability. So maybe you could start by explaining the meaning of the word or how you see it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, as we know, there is a there is a kind of established and kind of convenient definition of sustainability in terms of sustainable development, which I don't use directly in my research. For me, sustainability as a complete word or term as such, as such is the ability to sustain something, a system or an ecosystem. And, and now I'm touching to the point that Steve made about, are we really sure that when companies say they want to have a sustainability strategy that they are sustaining a system that is supposed to to, to exist or that should actually be dramatically changed. So I would still find uh, proper to think of sustainability as the ability to sustain, but when it comes to the value systems that are embedded into it, in my research, since I wanted management, top management especially, to be on board with this, I wanted to let them explore the topic by seeing how they place in this different taxonomy. Um, personally, I'm, I'm very much drawn by what's happening in the um, kind of eco-efficiency, eco uh, sorry, eco-effectiveness uh, paradigm. So we have such a thing as planetary boundaries. We can talk about absolute sustainability and safe operating space. If companies need to be really there on board and be sustainable, how they should relate with this uh, concept of strong sustainability or concept of absolute sustainability besides their incremental, uh, incremental efforts. So I would see the I would see that sustainability do uh, twofold in this sense something that we can address locally with the coefficients improvement, but also what we need to do is to to think on a total or strong sustainability. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, then we have a concept of a circular economy. Mm -hmm. How would you place that in the yeah. realm of sustainability? Yes, yes. So. I, um, the study that I made on the e-waste uh, grader was within this paradigm on circular economy because it carries not only the re strategies but also the virtualization on assets, the product service system. Uh, I'm not a scholar of in circular economy as such, but what I learned is that there is not a kind of straight answer that circular economy is the way. There are different strategies and some of them work and some don't. Uh, so for instance, for some products, extended use is not necessarily the, the best solution to, to adopt. So sustainability in this concept will still be to refer to the evaluation, in refer, referring to the evaluation of a circular economy strategy is this leading, is this strategy, this choice, this decision, is it leading to something that actually 
we want to sustain in the long run or not. That's why also I think, the, for instance, the environmental break-even point or consideration about, uh, um, about the Jevon paradox when you have uh, the uh, increase of prices when you have some efficiency gain and the price of the commodity became, well, the yeah, item, the material gets cheaper. So thinking in this way, I think circular economy could be a paradigm in which we can discuss idea and see options and opportunities, but it's good to bring it still back to the point of what is the system that we want to sustain in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah I kind of agree. I think in the when, when, when we're talking about sustainability, it also refers to something incremental. We, are, we have been talking about increments, but maybe circular economy is something that really challenges and uh, pushes the companies towards the boundaries by like, finding ways to combine e ecological and um, economical uh, like combinations. Yeah, yes. Okay, I, I come to the second question. I think in, in your thesis, it's in pages... Uh, uh, 43 and 44, but you also had a good table in your presentation, mm -hmm. I don't remember. So it's basically the, the cases yes, yeah, of the I understand companies the and the yeah. methodology you have been. Yeah. Is this is this one? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So actually, I was thinking that, did you have any company or any mm -hmm. case that involves both the uh, or aims at answering both the research question yeah. number one and number two. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, I would say, what I believe could make uh, the assessment framework stronger. Having a case that cuts across uh, research question one and two. Uh, definitely, I mean, if I have to apply the framework to any random manufacturing company, I see opportunities to explore both the questions in the same companies because one tackles like factors, the KPIs improvement and the one tackles the strategy. Um, definitely, I would find since the framework is supposed to be applicable, not only in terms of tools and methods, but to help them think about these different dimensions, uh, ideally, the same companies that contributed to the development of the framework, although in specific spots, could be candidate to have a sort of cross um, use, both for research question one or research question two. Of course, I could expect very different results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe in some cases, yeah. but maybe not in in some other cases. Yeah, yeah, I see what, what you mean. Um, I would say probably because in this um, set of companies uh, there were kind of major uh, conglomerates like one company was 400,000 people and normally what I, try, what I try to do with when I try to involve people uh, companies for research question two most of the time where the company was a a big group with a lot of visibility and a lot of like, responsibility of what they are doing. They say, look, we just, we know what to do. We have our strategy, we have our framework, so that's enough. And what I think it would be beneficial for them is that, of course, I don't mean to have my approach substituting theirs, but maybe if we could help that, if my approach could help them develop an idea that they can fit in the assistant framework, and then it would be even better. But no, I didn't I didn't get this opportunity to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is really impressive the amount of companies you have had in Thank in you. the in your study. And uh, actually you were discussing earlier that sometimes or, or very often the pressure to shift towards circular economy mm. or sustainable way of operating probably comes from outside. Mm. So from yeah. external pressure, yes. from legisl legislation, yes. or like uh, you need some dramatic change in the in 
operational environment before such uh, right. shift may happen. Right. But I, I think in your case, you also had the companies that were already within the circular economy. Yes. So they were basically in the front line of yes, the progress. Exactly. So yeah. in that case, I, I think this result would justify the uh, the methodology to be approached even in such new new situations. Exactly. Exactly. This is uh, also what I meant when I said to see that if we can demonstrate that is doable under certain defined condition then it's something that gives momentum to believe that other improvements are possible. And I know that as a researcher, we see the forefront of the field. So it feels like sometimes in this kind of eyeglass companies or the sorter, it looks like uh, heaven. So you have a very nice prototype and you sort the ways and you put in the marketplace and you have upgraded the technology and so forth. But again, the reason why we are here is to demonstrate, to provide... Uh, then related to this uh, this topic, uh, what was the like uh, rationale between mm. how, how did you choose the yeah. companies? Right, right. So I would say um, it was pretty easy. If I, I would say the more the type of contribution that I want to make was specific, like energy efficiency manufacturing, the more it's easy to narrow down a specific set, and then it depends on the uh, individual uh, willingness to, to explore the topic. So that, that part, the, the narrower is the, the contribution, the easier it was then to say I'm on board or not. Uh, but when it, so and that was the case for research question one. Uh, when it comes to research question two, that was a challenge and some companies uh, I, I approached to them and the idea again was to have an open frame or scope where you have discrete manufacturing where, for instance, I looked at the website and I see, uh, I don't know how they are addressing the problem, so let me, let me ask them how they are doing that. And the company said, of course, you can see in the slides where the one on board, but others uh, just refused because it could be, as I said before, that they felt confident with the approach they had. Or uh, also, as Steve said, they could get defensive. And, uh, and an answer that I received from a, uh, someone in top management in a company that you cannot see there because they didn't join is they... <coughs> There could be sometimes a sort of bias that we are a sort of three gaggers and we want to uh, we want to kind of change actively their business as opposed to be seen as a listener and trying to do this together. So probably the the way to frame the message uh, should be should be a little bit clearer. But some when they start to be defensive up front is, is really difficult if that they know you before, they know you from before. Okay, thank you. Then uh, one question related to the energy efficiency mm -hmm. uh, approach. Uh, you were mainly like concentrating on the operational level mm -hmm. in that respect, but uh, when trying to bridge the gap between the of management mm. and the operational yeah. level. Did you think about uh, like uh, you were talking about life cycle engineering, life mm -hmm. cycle yes. approach? But did you like uh, consider having the cost there, included, like uh, right. life cycle cost approach, mm. so that they have a common language? Right, right. I realized I didn't include, when I say life cycle thinking, I realized that I, I did include life cycle cost in, uh, in, my, in my framework or in my methodological tool. Uh, for instance, what I did in study two was simply calculating the operating cost and that's it. In paper three, there are some sorts of in, kind of in bullet points, what could be the cost for training the operator, what could be the cost for uh, continu continuing maintenance of this. So I kind of tried to do that, but it was really difficult to, I understand the struggle of the yeah. practitioner to actually come up <laughs> with serious number. And uh, I would say in order to 
come up with serious number, you need to have suppliers and uh, like the whole life cycle yes. people on board. And uh, yeah, that's, and, and that's really very challenging yeah. because then you just increase the complexity exactly, of your exactly, system. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I see the value in doing that for, of course, early design decision. In but, but it might be something you could do in the future if you're willing to like uh, combine the two approaches in, yes, in the same yes. company to to improve the like uh, message and uh, to provide the common language. Absolutely. And it's also a very well-known tool in the industry. So that's very easy to, to include, I would say, for them. Then I think I will... Uh, finalize my questioning with a very typical question. <laughs> if you would start again, <laughs> would you like uh, do everything sim in the uh, same way or would you do yeah. something in a different way? Yeah. Uh, as I said to Steve, like even though I was think I uh, could think on my own, well, maybe it could have been different if I would have done this or this. But in order for me to come up with the realization that I I described to, to you all before is because things went in a certain way. Uh, so I'm just grateful that that happened and that I was ready to understand them. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay yeah. I think it's my turn. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation and for the interesting um, data. Uh, it was very interesting to me to see that you've included in sustainability, uh, sustainable manufacturing, not only the KPIs mm. and the technical stuff, yeah. but try to, to um, make it uh, to include also the organization. Uh, and um, then um, you have really taken the approach of a top down, as yes. I understand it, and you're focusing on the management. Yeah. Um, and you have left out the operators, right. the persons. Um, what was the reason for this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say, of course, within the middle management, you can find a whole range of people who know more or less about the actual processes. Sometimes it could be the case that, for instance, if they've been in the company for a long time, then probably they started from an operational level and they went up. So they were still be very knowledgeable about also the details and the big picture. So I would say I was very lucky to have this source of people who could really range between the different levels from the details of the operation up. Uh, but only in one study, which I didn't perform as a first author in paper four, Actually, we had to interview uh, the, the first author had to interview two operators in the story because it was really about including the uh, getting the, the, the stones in a certain way and in certain quality. So we need to talk to the people at the national level. And uh, I would say also that that probably would have been easier for me to characterize by. site uh, we have where people are actually not always following the management and the right, procedures. Right, right. Um, I, I'm wondering a little bit um, if if you think that uh, in the next step mm. if you would, um, uh, sort of include also the outside external factors because mm. uh, you you as you mentioned, you have said that these companies have had some kind of sustainability focus yeah. and they have seen some kind of benefit of including sustainability. They want to, to reach the 12th goal here. But if the company, if the top management don't have this vision, <laughs> what is needed from the ex 
external from the outside. Right, right. Um, from actually, I can answer you from what I learned from previous examples of maturity models. Sometimes some of them are really much related to project management. And at a low level of maturity, uh, you can find examples such as you have the sort of the hero that try to put, to bring everybody on board. And if you remove this person, for instance, you give him or her another task, or if it leaves the organization, that's everything fall, falls down. Um, so, sorry, can you repeat the, well, the, the question? Well, I was thinking this hero, this yeah. she need to be in the top management? Uh, yeah, where do we start? Yeah, 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 right. Or, or actually from the grassroots, so to say. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, now and... To, to the top management to include sustainability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that the, the answer that I'm giving to you is not kind of backed with data because I didn't interview the operators. But I think as a, on a sort of societal level, we reached huge improvements when it comes to sustainability awareness. So of course, they reach people that works in factories too. Uh, and actually on, on LinkedIn, when I joined, actually, there was a group called the shipbuilding, shipbuilding professionals. And uh, when I ask a question there, there are people that say, oh, you can run a car with the gas that you lose and all these sorts of things. So they are very much aware about the problem. And I think there is a, a huge opportunity to bring them on board and really have a quick survey of what, what is going wrong in, in the facility production shipyard. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree. <laughs> um, and it sort of uh, comes back to um, the organizational readiness. Yeah. Uh, and I was just having uh, uh, some questions on that. Um, I think it's on fig in figure four and paper five and perhaps 69. Mm -hmm. 69. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, you had um, asked the people to, to score yes. the organization. That is for the tool development, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, but then you have, in the, in the very last, you have uh, organizational sustainability readiness score. Mm -hmm. How did you calculate that? Okay, so in the, as I said to Steve before, the, the in the development, the, of course, since the tool is not ready, the score is just a kind of a mental picture and my task as a researcher is to decodify this information why is two and not three and what has to happen so that codification was summarized in the actual questions that you get in the in the final survey uh, when it comes to actually using the tool when it's ready um, simply in a mix which is the survey that i survey tool that i used uh, they basically can see, I can actually show it. So they don't see the numbers, of course, but they see actually a, a matrix in this way and they just click. Uh, and uh, then in the end, the, when, they, when they can see the score, it will be a, the, the average. So, so standard deviation. Okay, yeah. so they all have the same weight. That is really my yes, question. Yes, yes. Uh, and if they have the same <laughs> they are not linked you mean the different tables with different, different dimensions uh, well the different uh, i don't know if you call them capabilities yeah yeah, yeah. right uh, right you, and you, you mentioned that some of the capabilities were linked yeah they have the same way right right they are not linked. i understand what you mean so the idea in since it was apparently already difficult to get people on board to try this 10-minute survey, uh, ideally this is dedicated to for one capability only, so for <coughs> what is really important for the operations, nothing stops you from trying different ones. But I agree with you, and I think I mentioned also in the paper, it gets difficult to combine the results if you test different things, yeah. because then, of course, the first you test it would be more important than achieving a maturity in the second in the third and so forth yeah yeah 
I'm really very happy that you touch upon capabilities because we see that's becoming very popular. We'll see it in Horizon Europe. Yeah. We talk about capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as you mentioned, uh, some like the top management may understand the word capability, but the lower you come, the more difficult it becomes, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so just by treating it and, and really addressing it as a readiness because we have uh, sort of understood or are trying to understand technology readiness right, level. Right, right, right. Now we're sort of moving up to organizational uh, right. readiness level in this age. Right. It's very interesting, and it really makes us understand that we are talking about persons yeah. uh, who in, in the companies are uh, supported, uh, at, at least for now, by machines, uh, and we have to work in that context and, and try to find the, the interplay between um, technology and, and people. And yes. I think you have addressed it very nicely. Oh, uh, and uh, finally, um, what, what's one of the strongest points here is the reflection the, in your travel as a, or in your journey as, as a start, as a starting off somewhere and then uh, learning more and more and more and reflecting on things. I, I think that's a really strong point. You you rarely see this in, in CSIS, at least from my um, area. And, and I think that is one of the most important things, at least what we uh, in, in, in practice look for. Um, we may have need for people with strong, strong expertise, but even greater need for people uh, reflecting and being able to do this journey in a new topic. Right, so I right. think that that was a um, very good part uh, in including this in your thesis. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for your presentation, mm -hmm. the nice discussion. So uh, I have some questions, of course, as well. Although it's not <laughs> yeah. that easy. The last uh, um, guy to question something. I would ask something. Yeah. Uh, I'm an astro industrial engineer as well, and then of course an important thing is always is to ensure a certain comprehensiveness in yes. the things you do, and of course set the right priorities, evaluate, and so on. So uh, and of course your motivation is on sustainability. And you motivated your work uh, strongly through the sustainability uh, development goals. Mm -hmm. um, just more of interest, you strongly focused on this SDG 12. Um, however, don't you think there might be linkages to the others oh. as well? Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe you can even. Yes. So that everybody sees. Okay. Yes. Where do you see the links to others? Oh, right. <laughs> um, the strongest link, I would say, with the ninth industry innovation and infrastructure. And it ties with the answer that I gave to Elena before, like uh, to what I had the opportunity to see is that how technology prototypes that we have the opportunity to analyze work and uh, what, are, but at the same time, they shouldn't be uh, understood as a key role for everything. So let's analyze where they work and doesn't. So if we have to get to that goal, it's not that we just throw a bunch of technology and we expect that it's going to work, but uh, having the sorts of evaluation tools can help us understand which kind of uh, automation content we want to aim, which kinds of innovation, how much we should push innovation. There is this uh, in sustainability, we have the theory of exploitation and uh, um, exploitation and exploration. So, yeah, an evaluation tool could help understand where do you want to, to place yourself in the next goal. Um, I would say also education. I know that I didn't specifically address social sustainability, uh, at least in the core of my papers. There, there are insights in the um, appended papers that are kind of, yeah, additional. Uh, what was the goal that I was trying? Yes, eighth, decent work and economic growth. So again, if we are talking about, I'm tying that with the answer that I gave to Elena, like what kind of system we want to sustain. And if everything goes right, we are helping companies with a clear purpose to address this goal, to keep on operating in, in the best way. So that would, 
that would secure the type of economic growth that we want to secure. So I'm not talking about numbers, and I know that there is a, a big discussion about how fast developed economies should grow in comparison to developing countries. But if we look at what kinds of responsible consumption and production we want to have, then we have a sort of blueprints of what kind of growth we want to achieve. Okay, thanks. I also think then that even strengthens your approach that it yeah. has contributions to far more, even far more uh, of these goals than just this 12 or even 8. Yeah. But uh, leading also to my second, because uh, sustainability is, of course, uh, the environmental perspective, economic, social, so the dimensions, which uh, and all of those have different units, let's say, technically speaking. Yeah. Uh, global warming potential is one of the yeah. famous ones. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, you have in your, all your talks, um, you didn't really name a specific unit. It's more on an abstract level, which is fine. Mm. Uh, however, of course, in the end, you have to make it clear what is yes. the unit. And yes. my, my question is actually, how do you deal with maybe conflicts of goals that might occur between different units, for example, uh, global uh, warming potential costs? Yes, whatever. yes, yes, yes. Uh, that is also something that emerged when I tried to validate the environmental break-even point. One of the criticisms was, uh, well, okay, but money talks louder, so who cares that the new technology pays back in, uh, I don't know, five years. If my economic uh, payback time of a new investment is two years, I need to make it happen. Um, but that's okay. even yeah. that's, that's leave out the economy yeah. but even within environmental sustainability yeah. if you have global oh, right, potential right. And, and, yes. and i don't know resource depletion or yes. whatever yes 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 so what's, what's worse right right uh again this is also i would use still the example of the environmental break-even point because another input that i received was uh, okay which it's for one indicator only so in which indicator is is more important to get uh, i would say it really boils down to the nature of the technology and what kind of impacts it can have across the life cycle. Um, also, what I found uh, really interesting, again, in the what's happening, the sustainable, sustainable investing and SDG is the materiality, the concept of materiality. So materiality maps uh, and doing the environmental break even on, uh, on those material issues could be um, could be water intensity, could be particular uh, consumption of uh, could be energy, could be oh, whatever other issue that is really material for the company. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually the perfect assist yeah. to my yeah. for the question because, uh, as you said, it could be different areas uh, you should focus on, and I guess your framework assists to uh, do prioritization. Yes. However, at the operative level, you focus on the energy demand. Right. What's the reason for that? Maybe it could be right. I know, very practical reasons. Yeah. Do so, but yeah, is there yeah. any? Could be material efficiency something. As right, well. right, right. Because when I also showed the, I can actually go here. When I was describing this last point, I said, okay, why energy? You could improve operations in many different ways. Uh, I would say uh, there is a principle of convenience because if you have system that measure energy sensor monitors and so forth then is something that is kind of um it's easy to connect with co2 emission with climate impact so it gives you a straight line from what happens in the operation and what could be the impact uh, elsewhere um it was as simple as it is the the first topic that got my interest as yes. a master master student normally we kind of go uh, come across something that uh, interests us um yeah <laughs> i wish <laughs> yeah, i'm trying to think about something else so there is a point of interest there is a point of convenience in breaking down and how it works in the machine and so forth um Definitely, there are people here in Sweden who are looking also a lot on the material material efficiency in, in production. But again, if I had to choose the next one, then if I have to choose the next yeah, uh, type of resource efficiency that is uh, worthwhile, uh, worthwhile investigating, I would actually need to narrow down the set of companies because, again, the materiality 
uh, concept that I mentioned before. So, of course, if I want to study water, it should be about, I don't know, textile or something like that and not in, yeah, shop floor. Yes, it's still something, but it's not really a key issue. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, my last two questions are uh, quite straightforward, referring to applicability, mm. maybe. Yes. You yeah. can shine on this, because I think um, you uh, said several times, actually, you would have not focused on fro process industry that much. Yeah. Uh, you're focused on discrete manufacturing. Where do you see the big challenge to transfer that to process industry? I right, point there, right, right. Uh, I wish I could have spoken to people in that industry to understand why, how it can be easy or uh, not that easy to actually be there. I would say that the impressions that I got from, from that industry is that probably there are less variables in comparison to the discrete manufacturing to play with. Mm. It's a very kind of monolithic standardized process. Mm. Um, but again, there is a lot of thing to do in terms of efficiency improvement. I don't know that much the, how it works there, but I think probably big disruption can happen also in, uh, for instance, changing the materials or changing something in the life cycle in the building sector. I know that it is possible to, how to do something with the materials from old buildings and so forth. So probably I would say that it's easier to address the problem, more possibility to address the problem from a life cycle perspective as opposed to the um, facility as such, because yeah, I see it as a, there are few significant levers to put, but less variability and less complexity than in discrete manufacturing. Mm. Probably that is my guess. Yeah. I agree and think that some of your approaches could well be transferred into this area as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my last question is uh, maybe to sum up a little bit as well. Uh, you, you mentioned and showed uh, that there is, of course, a lot of approaches uh, in research on those kind of topics and different tools and so on. So what, uh, but you said you want to bridge the gap to application, right? So what makes you sure yeah. that now your approach works better uh, than others? So what's, um, what do you think, what's the unique selling point in terms yeah. of application? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an uh, important and tough question. Uh, I would say there is value in bringing everything together in a uh, structure that tells you is that actually the, the flow that I was describing before. I think that is the strongest point that could bridge the gap. So rather than talking about a certain tool that can bridge the gap or not, which is still valuable, what I'm actually bringing here is a flow with which you can use them for achieving the goal. Uh, so I think if we start looking at sustainability assessment in this way, then also it will kind of draw the attention on individual tools and methods that we have. So big picture then and then, and then tools and methods. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the audience. Anyone have a question? Can always trust. Yes, thank you. Sister. Actually, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a really spirited discussion, by the way. That was so enjoyable to listen to. Uh, we actually have a question from Australia, so I'm only acting as mouthpiece here. Uh, based on your discoveries, what is your understanding of the relationship between, on the one hand, pure research and the practical world you're trying to influence? both as an ideal and as you see it. The, uh, I can read it again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the big one, yeah. Yes, can you read it again? Okay. Based on your discoveries, yeah. what's your understanding of the relationship uh -huh. between what we do as researchers and the real world you're trying to influence? Okay, okay. Yeah, I would say, actually, I can connect with the slide that I presented at the beginning about model, the production system as a model. So since the reality that we are analyzing is complex, we need a model that is a simplification of reality. And that is an excellent starting point to explore something, but we need to enrich this model with the real life experience. So probably I would say to, if the, the, the end goal of the question is to how to make these relationships work better, probably is 
for us researchers go a little bit up there and systematizing and uses this knowledge to improve our model and to make it more accurate for what we are trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, he says the question, uh, hope he doesn't cause you grief with this question and he's very proud of you. So, <laughs> uh, I have a question of my own. Um, you've talked to so many different companies now and I mean, you've sort of been out there with your glasses on about what makes a company ready to transition, basically. Mm -hmm. What are the stories they tell you that sort of gives you intuitively the mm -hmm. feeling that, okay, these people are high on the readiness and high on the uh, mm -hmm. maturity? Like, what sort of story do they tell right. about their company? Right, right. I would say mm -hmm. that from the way I observed this specific topic, for me, the, the awareness is the basic point, the starting point that they have awareness of the problem. But if they are, every time that they repeat, we know that this is a serious issue and we have to address it and so forth, then for me, they set themselves for success because I know that they will do everything in their power to get to a highest level of maturity. So it's, yeah, the awareness of the issue as such, but also about the awareness of how far they are but, and what's start starting point, but also if it's really strong and if it's into kind of creeps in all the conversation, then it gives you an indication that they will arrive at the high end in, in, in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? We have exhausted the, <laughs> the question list and the, the knowledge. Um, then I would like to uh, formally close this part of the procedure. Thank everyone for coming here. Thanking uh, the opponent for being uh, tough and uh, honest and uh, clear opponent. I think you, you did a very, very good job and getting the best and the worst out of the thesis. Uh, and also thank the, the grading committee for uh, being here from, from far away. And um, Bjorn for supporting Ilaria. And Ilaria for making a, a great defense. So thank you everyone. <laughs> so now the next step is to uh, to decouple the, the live stream, I think, and uh, to, re to go back to, the, to my office with the grading committee and the opponent. And for the rest of you, you are all invited to the fifth floor, uh, IMS department, and uh, uh, wait there with, uh, there are some refreshments, but uh, then you can wait for us outside. Thank you very much, Nico. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much.